nanohub.org. My job today is to tell you something about the electrostatic force microscope and give you a sense of how you can use a, an AFM to also get information about the electrostatic properties of a sample. Before we launch into the electrostatic force microscope, I thought it might be useful to do a very brief review of some simple electrostatic facts that you've all learned in your introductory classes. Uh, when you took your introductory physics class, you presumably learned about this. I'm just going to review it uh, because it, it's kind of useful to think about how these uh, charges and fields set up. It gives you a, some better understanding of, of the electrostatic force microscope. So the basic idea is if you have a metal plate, which I show a, a side view of, and the metal plate is that, that long rectangle, and if you put charge on it, you dump, dump a certain amount of charge plus Q onto it, that charge is said to produce an electric field, and the electric field uh, uh, moves away from positive charges by definition. So on either side of the plate, there's an electric field that, that permeates all space. And the electric field is pretty uniform as you get Close to the metal plate, for, for instance, the electric field is very uniform. As you start to move a distance away from the metal plate, non-uniformity set in, uh, just due to the finite geometry of the problem. But close, close to the plate, the electric field is well approximated by those, those arrows. Now, it's a fair question to ask, what is the strength of the electric field when you charge up a macroscopic object? Um, that calculation re requires a, a, a little bit more advanced uh, mathematics than the simple point charge that you're used to dealing with. But if you use, uh, let's say, Gauss's law, um, you can very quickly show that for this problem, because of the high symmetry involved, the electric field is equal to the charge density sigma divided by two epsilon naught. So sigma is defined, defined as the charge per unit area that's put on that plate. And that's a parameter that has to be uh, experimentally measured. Uh, you either have to control the charge Q that you put on or you have to be able to measure the electric field and then infer back to get the, 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 the charge density sigma. Epsilon naught is this fundamental constant. It's the permittivity of vacuum of free space. And it's a constant that shows up when you, when you write the force law between two point charges and the force in Newtons. You have to have a proportionality constant in there and that epsilon naught is, is, is part of that proportionality constant. So that's, that's the situation for a positively charged plate. Not surprisingly, if you charge the plate negative, you get a similar result, except now the electric fields are all reversed because now electric fields terminate on negative charges. That's the fundamental definition of electric field direction. Right? So you can have these two uh, situations where these two plates are isolated in space, uh, removed far far from each other and the electric fields that, that set up are as indicated. Of course, it's an interesting question. What happens when you move two plates um, so that they're parallel to one another and one of the plates is positively charged, the other plate is negatively charged? So when you move these two plates so that they're separated by, let's say, a distance d apart, uh, the electric fields inside the plates add. The electric fields outside the plates cancel. So to a very good approximation, the electric fields outside the plates sum to zero. The electric fields from the positive plate and the negative plate add up and produce a net electric field between the plates which is just sigma divided by epsilon naught because both plates are assumed to have the same area Okay. They also assume they have the same charge. The only difference is the polarity of the charges are different. 
So this sets up the, uh, the problem of a parallel plate capacitor and the, it, it allows you to understand the electric fields inside parallel plate capacitor and there are certain very simple results that are associated with this geometry. Uh, <clears throat> in particular, it's much easier to measure the voltage difference between the plates than it is to measure the electric field that, that sets up inside the plates. So this voltage difference, which I call capital V, it's also known as delta V in some, some of the textbooks you may have looked at. Uh, it's just a potential difference between the, the gray plate and the, and the green plate in this parallel plate uh, capacitor arrangement. That potential difference is defined as the electric field, the net electric field between the plates times the distance D that the two plates are separated. And in terms of the charges uh, that are on the plate, that potential difference V is just the charge divided by epsilon naught times the area of one plate divided by the separation D that, that exists. So it's a, it's a fair question to ask if you apply a certain voltage difference between the two plates. It's a fair question to ask how much charge is transferred to each plate. That turns out to be a very fundamental question. And it's often discussed in the context of parallel plates, but it's a general question that, that's useful to answer. So if you just have any two metals, pieces of metal, and you connect a battery between the two metal plates or two metal, two pieces of metal, how much charge is actually transferred from the battery to each plate? <coughs> um, for the case of the parallel plates, it's very easy to solve. If you measure the voltage that you apply, you know the area of the plates, you know the separation between them, then you can solve for the charge that the battery is going to put on each plate. But in general, what you, want, what you need to do in order to calculate this charge transfer is you have to calculate what the capacitance of any two arbitrarily shaped pieces of metal are, one with respect to another. If you can calculate what the capacitance is of these two pieces of metal, then the charge that's transferred is defined as the ratio of Q over V. So you define C as the ratio of Q over V. If you can calculate C, which depends only on geometry, so G, C is a geometrical constant, you know what C is in advance and you know the voltage that you apply, then you can solve that simple equation to get the, the charge Q out. Uh, and that's a useful number to know because if the capacitance of two pieces of metal are very high and you apply a voltage to those two pieces of metal, you can transfer a huge amount of charge. So it's useful to know how much charge you're always moving around. So just by simple arithmetic, right, the capacitance for the parallel plates, standard result, epsilon naught A over D. So you tell me the area of the plates, you tell me the separation, I can tell you the capacitance. And that capacitance is defined as the ratio of Q on each plate divided by the voltage applied between the two plates. So in general, the third line on this slide uh, tells you what the capacitance is if you allow the distance between the plates to vary. So if you, say, separate the plates by a distance Z, this is the formula that would then allow you to calculate what the capacitance is. And it's useful to calculate the derivative of the capacitance with respect to Z. So I do that in the third line. And for again, for the parallel plate geometry, it's very easy. It's a very easy calculation. So the change in capacitance with respect to Z turns out to be equal to epsilon naught A divided by the distance D squared uh, that the two plates are separated one from another. Turns out there's a negative sign associated with that derivative. Uh, that negative sign is not terribly important in the discussion that, that follows. It just just, it's just going to tell us directions of, of forces, as we'll see. So since this whole discussion is, is focused on atomic force microscopy, it's useful to be able to calculate the force that the two plates exert on each other. And that calculation of the force, at least the magnitude of the force, that can be done 
by, uh, in a very simple way, by, for instance, calculating the total charge on the right plate, which is the green plate in this schematic diagram. If you multiply the total charge on the right plate by the electric field that's generated by the left plate, that tells you the force that the green plate experiences with respect to the, the gray plate. So <clears throat> the total charge on the right plate uh, is Q. Uh, I take the absolute value because I'm not interested so much in directions. Uh, the electric field generated by the left plate is just one half of the electric field that's present inside the capacitors. Recall the electric field inside the capacitor has two contributions. One is from the positively charged plate, the other is from the negatively charged plate. If we want to calculate the force between the plates, we just need the electric field produced by, in this case, the positively charged plate. So that's where that factor of one half comes in. And <clears throat> when you do a little bit of arithmetic, uh, you can convince yourself that the force between the plates is a, is a geometrical constant, this epsilon naught A over D squared, uh, times the voltage squared to, that you apply between the two plates. And the force is always attractive. That's the thing to remember. No matter what plate is charged positive, which plate is charged negative, uh, if you apply a voltage between the plates, the force goes as the voltage squared. And that's a pretty good approximation as long as the plates are parallel to one another and they're close to each other. It doesn't really matter whether the plates are square or, or circular or triangular. Right? You just tell me what the area of the plates are and you make sure both plates have the same area. And if the separation between the plates is small compared to the lateral dimension of the plates, that's not a bad approximation for the attractive force. You can do better by doing a little bit more uh, uh, arithmetic, but I don't think for our purposes um, we need to worry about that. So that quantity in red, that epsilon naught A over D squared, that is that, that turns out to be just the derivative of the capacitance with respect to Z. I try to indicate that by color coding the equations. And so at the end of the day, in general, you can write uh, the force between the plates is proportional to the voltage squared. The one half comes about because you're just interested in the electric field produced by one of the plates. And this geometrical constant is basically the derivative of a capacitance with respect to Z. And that's the fundamental equation that, that you use when you do electrostatic force microscopy. It was derived for a parallel plate capacitor, but if you have two metal objects with complicated geometry, and if you know how the capacitance between these objects changes as you vary the separation between them, so if you know DC, DZ, and then you tell me the voltage difference between the two chunks of metal, I can tell you using that formula what the force is. Okay? So again, the DC, DZ is going to be a negative number. That cancels the negative number in front of the one half, and the force tends to be, the force is always attractive. So this suggests a very simple experiment, which maybe you've done in your introductory physics class, lab class, I don't know. But the simple experiment is to take a pan balance and make the two pans of the pan balance just flat metal plates. And if you connect a um, a voltage source between one of the pans and a stationary plate, as I've got indicated in this little cartoon, right, there will be a force, there will be an attractive force that will pull the pan towards the stationary plate. The amount of the force is just V squared over 2 times the partial of C with respect to Z. And of course that force can then be balanced or counterbalanced with by adding weights to the other pan on the pan balance. And so you can, just by adding weights to the right-hand pan, you can measure the force that's generated when you, whenever you apply a voltage between the two plates. And this is a common way to, to verify this, this simple arithmetic that we've derived in this, these first two slides. 
So it's a real simple experiment, and it's often done in introductory physics courses uh, to convince you that there is an attractive force. So that is the basis of electrostatic force microscopy. Uh, the other thing we have to talk a, a little bit about is, is something called a contact potential difference. Contact potential difference is, um, is a concept that, that, that comes about whenever you place two pieces of metal in close proximity to one another. So the simple model for a metal is a, is a potential well that has many, many quantum states in it, and you can fill up those quantum states with electrons up until some maximum energy, which is referred to as the Fermi energy. So if I have two pieces of metal, let's say one piece of metal is red and the other piece of metal is blue, and the two metals are dissimilar, it's possible that the uh, Fermi energies of these two metals are completely different, one with respect to another. In other words, one metal could have more electrons than the other, just because of the, the chemical uh, makeup of the two metals. And so that's what I've tried to illustrate in panel A of this, <coughs> this diagram. I've got two metal plates that are represented by these potential wells. Potential wells are filled up by electrons to keep things straight. We have red electrons and blue electrons. We have two different Fermi levels. One is the Fermi level of, let's say, the tip. So we'll pretend it's a tip in a plate instead of two plates. So one is the Fermi level of the tip. The other is the Fermi level of the substrate. There's no reason why those two Fermi levels should be equal to one another, a priori. If the two metals are disconnected, the zero of energy in this problem is referred to as the vacuum level, and that's this dashed line, horizontal line, at the top of the uh, of this energy diagram. It's referred to as E vacuum in this uh, panel A, and that E vacuum tends to set the zero of energy in the problem. So whenever an electron is above E vacuum, it can be treated as a classical electron. It's got a mass. It's got a charge, Newton's laws apply. If the electron is below E vacuum, then it's a quantum particle. You have to solve Schrodinger's equation. You have a wave function. You can get quantum tunneling, for instance, through potential barriers. So that E vacuum is, a, is like a demarcation line between a classical and a quantum electron. Now, why don't the electrons in a metal just jump out of the metal and spill onto a table. Because everybody knows electrons are negatively charged and opposite charges or, or, or like charges repel. So you would expect the electrons might just spill out of the metal, empty out onto the table, for instance. Why doesn't that happen? Well, the reason it doesn't happen is there's a barrier that holds the electrons into the metal and that barrier is comprised of all these unfilled states that lie between the Fermi level and that, le that energy level E vacuum. <clears throat> and the height of that barrier is often referred to as the work function of the metal. It's, in this diagram, it's referred to as phi tip if you're looking at the red part of the diagram, or phi substrate if you're looking at the blue part of the diagram. And those two work functions are dissimilar. There's no reason to believe they should be the same. And it's the, the, those work functions are responsible for keeping the electrons confined in the, in, the, in the metal piece. How big are the work functions? Depends on the metal. Right? Work functions tend to be five, four and a half to five and a half electron volts. So that sort of sets the energy scale for the problem. How big are the uh, difference in work functions? The difference in work functions can be on the order of a couple tenths to maybe a half a volt. Right, depending, again, on the two metals that are involved. So that's the situation <clears throat> when there's no electrical connection between the two metals. What happens is this vacuum level for the two, two metals line up, one with respect to another. And there's actually a, 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 
a, a discontinuity in the Fermi levels because the two 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 metal pieces are physically uh, or they're not electrically connected. Situation changes if you make an electrical connection. If you just wire up the two metal plates or the tip and the substrate. When you wire them up, now it's possible that this contact potential difference, which is defined as the difference in work function between the tip and the substrate. So now I define cap, uh, capital delta capital phi. That's, that's known as a contact potential difference. That, that difference in, in Fermi levels can drive electrons from one metal to the other. And so for the geometry that I've got drawn, uh, electrons would go from the substrate to the tip, and these these electrons would flow until the Fermi levels balance, until they're actually equilibrated, one with respect to another. When the two Fermi levels are equal to one another, no current can flow. That current flows instantaneously as soon as you connect the two metals together. Right? And, and I represent it as a, as a transfer of charge dq, so a number of electrons move from one metal to the other. <clears throat> so, how do you measure what this contact potential difference is, this delta phi? Well, one way to do it is to, to measure how much charge flows between the plates when they're electrically connected. And I indicate that in panel C. Right? If you measure the amount of charge that flows, and you know what the capacitance is, then the contact potential difference is just the integral of the charge divided by, multiplied by one over the capacitance. And that gives you physically a measure of this contact potential difference, this voltage difference that's present just because the Fermi levels are misaligned. So that's a very, very nice way to actually measure um, uh, contact potential differences because if you just look at the metals, you can't tell what the contact potential difference is, right? You can't go to Walmart and buy a meter that can measure that contact potential difference. It's an elusive concept. So one way to get at it is by measuring the charge and integrating and dividing a, a multiplying it by one over the capacitance. Okay? When that charge flows from the blue metal to the red metal, an electric field eventually sets up. That electric field is represented by the, the, the solid arrows E, and the electric field sets up just because now there's an imbalance of charge between the two metals. Okay? That electric field, the presence of that electric field also implies that there is now a barrier that connects the red metal to the blue metal. So I try to sketch the shape qualitatively. I sketch the shape of that barrier. It looks like a trapezoid. And if you listen to the first few lectures of this, uh, uh, of this semester when we talked about STM, you'll recognize that that trapezoidal barrier looks like the tunnel barrier that electrons have to move through when you do scanning tunneling microscopy. And then the last point I want to make is that this electric field that now exists between your two metals, that electric field can be nullified by just simply applying a bias voltage, as I've shown in panel D here. Now the bias voltage has to, you have to connect the battery in the correct way to cancel out the electric field, but eventually if you put in the correct bias voltage such that the bias voltage is equal to minus the contact potential difference, then you return the situation back to the original case, except now the two metals are connected. They're electrically connected. That's the important difference. And by adjusting that bias voltage, and by adjusting the, both the polarity and the magnitude of the bias voltage, right, you can also get an estimate of what the contact potential difference is. So these, these ideas are also important when we're starting to measure uh, electrostatic potentials that exist between, let's say, a tip and a metal surface. And I just wanted to try to walk, walk you through this diagram and try to explain it uh, because this sort of background, I think, is important to understand what follows. So this concept of a contact potential difference is a very old problem. It goes back into the 1860s, and it was solved by uh, Lord Kelvin uh, 
he, he pointed out that by measuring the current that flows when you connect two metals, two dissimilar metals, one with respect to another, if you measure the current that flows, you integrate that current over time, that tells you the total charge that's moved, and you divide that by the capacitance between the two, let's say in this case, two metal plates, then you've got an estimate of the contact potential difference. This is a measurement that could actually be done in the 1860s. It was improved on uh, dramatically um, in 1932. Uh, William Zisman realized that uh, you can make a much more accurate measurement of this contact potential difference if you vibrate one plate with respect to another with a piezo. So I, I indicate that here. And <clears throat> I also bring in the concept of a reference plate. So the reference plate is a plate in which everybody in the world agrees they know what the work function is. It's usually platinum, right? Some inert metal, platinum or gold. And everybody agrees they know what that work function is so that when you measure these contact potential differences, you always measure them with respect to the same reference work function phi. So I call it phi reference. And, and the way this, way Zisman's technique works is by by vibrating the two plates back and forth, you cause a, a time-dependent current to flow. Right? So maybe that's not obvious. But everything goes back to the definition of capacitance. <clears throat> and so... By moving the plates back and forth, what you do is you're basically taking the time derivative of this equation. So you take dq dt, right? The voltage is fixed, so you get dc dt times v. So dq dt is a current i. So just by physically moving these plates back and forth, you're changing the capacitance between the plates because you're changing the distance, the separation between them, and this capacitance depends on one over the distance. So it's a very clever way to turn a contact potential difference, which is fixed. V is fixed in this problem. It's a very clever way to turn that into a current at a specific frequency omega. So if you drive the vibrator at the frequency uh, omega, then you have to measure the current that flows at that same frequency omega. <clears throat> and uh, by measuring that current that flows, it's going to be proportional to the contact potential difference between your reference plate and your substrate, your unknown plate. And what you do with this bias voltage is you adjust the electric field between these two plates due to this contact potential difference. You adjust that electric field to be zero. And when the electric field between the plates is zero, then the current at the frequency omega goes to zero. And you've got a very sensitive null circuit to measure contact potential differences. So... This is, this is the, the so-called Kelvin probe that you can buy commercially. It's, it has many advantages. It's very sensitive because it's a null technique. You're, you're, you're literally adjusting V bias until the current that flows at the frequency omega goes to zero. The frequency at, at, at omega is controlled by the frequency of your vibration. Because it's a null technique, it's extremely sensitive. You can probably measure contact potential differences down to one to five millivolts accuracy with this, this technique. Um, it's non-contact and it's non-destructive. That's another advantage. So all it requires you, you is to suspend a plate next to your reference plate and you're, you're vibrating the reference plate. So it's, it's a very simple way to measure contact potential differences. From contact potential differences, you can infer work function differences of different metals. So this is, this is uh, the, the so-called Kelvin probe technique for, for measuring uh, contact potential differences. And this forms the basis of this, this electrostatic force microscope. So uh, it can also then therefore be used uh, on insulators also uh, that have trapped charges on them. And ultimately the effect is 
is similar. There's some interstatics relationship with the path charge, and the nulling idea can still be used. And the only trouble is when you apply a voltage to an insulator, I don't know really what happens. Well, there's got to be an insulator above. So let's say there's a conductor, and then you sample a insulator, and then it can't be used a conductor. Um, in that case, you know you might actually have trapped charges on the on the insulator, right? The yeah, nulling would take that into account as well. Yeah, I think organic compounds like drugs. I think if the insulator is in is very thin and if it's in good electrical contact with the plate, right. you can make it work. But I think it's if you take a piece of nylon or, or Teflon and it's got a finite thickness to it, I'm not so sure. Yeah, I spin coating. Yeah, I think if you have thin thin layers of insulators, possibly this would work. But I've never thought about that. I used usually you have to be able to put a voltage and know that the voltage that you apply shifts the Fermi levels. Right? If you've got an insulator, that, that doesn't work so well anymore. Uh, I mean, it's just that ultimately, I mean, the Fermi levels will change with the voltage of the metal, but then you, know, you have metal, uh, and then you might have a polymer, you have air, and then you have metal. Uh, the uh, trap charges are also going to modify the ultimate capacitance. So they might it's sort of well, a lot of things will modify the capacitance yes. if you put an insulator in there, right? There'll be another dielectric constant, exactly. and true. right. And so there's some places where there might be charge, some places where there might not be charge. Yeah, the so charge is not uniform anymore. So, it, I'm sure people have done it, right? I don't know whether it's a valid measurement or not. I would not try it because it, <clears throat> it's kind of beyond beyond my limit to understand how voltages applied to insulators would affect Fermi levels when or any other issues. Just that it shouldn't be called Kelvin force microscopy, it should be called Zisman force microscopy. Well, Kelvin was a lord <laughs> and Zisman was a doctor, so I think the lord trumps the doctor in this case. <laughs> I mean, everything goes back to Kelvin ultimately, right? He did so much. Um, and and I, I should also mention that Zisman is, that's the way I read the literature, right? There's people that, uh, scientists that maybe know more about this than I do that could point to a scientists before Zisman, but when I look at things, that's that's who it seemed to me introduced this vibrating plate uh, idea. Well, I think the next question is, can you apply these classical ideas, these concepts that go back 50, 60, 100 years, right? Can you apply those concepts to uh, the atomic force microscope and um, I think the answer is yes. The uh, first paper that I'm aware of that pointed out the, the capability of an atomic force microscope tip to measure electrostatic potential differences between a tip and a substrate, that paper was published in 1991. I cite the, cite the paper for your reference. But basically, if you're going to do this type of measurement, you need a sensitive you need a, an ability to measure forces with high sensitivity. In our case, that capability is just a cantilever. It's a force transducer, so we don't, we don't need this complicated pan balance anymore. Now, what we have to do is we have to be able to connect a bias, a bias voltage between a cantilever and the substrate. We have to be able to adjust that bias voltage to null out the electrostatic force between the tip and the substrate. So that's that's the basic idea. Um, how it works uh, is a little bit more complicated than that. Uh, there are, let me say, there are a number of ways to implement this. The way I like to think about it is sketched out into the, into the in the next few slides. 
So the, the basic idea is we have a substrate, which is indicated by this blue plate. And you can think of that blue plate as having uh, an inhomogeneous voltage distributed across it. It's due to inhomogeneities, let's say, in the work function of the, of the plate. So we represent that inhomogeneity as, as a voltage V sub S. S is for the substrate. It can depend on position. So at every point X, Y on the substrate, there could be a different electrostatic potential that's present. That electrostatic potential variation can be due to adsorbates. It could be due to inhomogeneities, it could be, right? It's up. And what we want to do is we want to measure V sub S as a function of X and Y. Well, the way we do that is we take an AFM tip and we have to make it conducting. So we have to coat it with gold or platinum, whatever metal you choose to use. Um, the reason you have to make it conducting is because you're going to apply a voltage to that tip. You want that voltage to be uh, uh, uniform over the entire region, of the cantilever and tip. The way to do that is to make the tip conducting. Um, the voltage that we're going to apply to the tip is going to have two components. One is going to be a DC voltage, which is referred to as V-tip. And then there's going to be a small AC voltage, which is referred to as v naught sine of omega 1T. So those two voltages are simultaneously applied to the tip. At the same time that those voltages are applied, we also cause the tip to vibrate by applying the signal to the dither piezo. The signal to the dither piezo is going to have a different frequency, omega sub r, from the voltage that we apply, the electrostatic voltage that we apply to the tip. So omega 1 and omega r are different. And uh, what we find is that the force on the cantilever is now going to depend on the contact potential difference between the tip and the substrate when the tip is positioned at some point over the substrate. And that contact potential difference is just represented as delta V. It's just the voltage on the substrate at some point X, Y, minus the voltage on the voltage, the DC voltage on the tip plus this AC voltage V naught sine of omega 1T. So that's the contact potential difference. So that contact potential difference will generate a force by the arguments that we already went through in the first part of the talk. How big of a force? Well, it's going to depend on how the capacitance of the tip varies with Z. It's a number that we don't really know very accurately, but in principle, as you change the position of the tip, the capacitance will change. Uh, the voltage will be, or the force will be proportional to the voltage squared, the contact potential difference squared between the two, uh, two materials, the substrate and the tip. So now delta V contains this complicated term in the yellow box, and so I have to square that, and I go through the arithmetic, uh, some of it at least. Uh, when you square the term in the yellow box, you end up with three separate terms. Uh, the three terms are distinguished by the, their time variation. The first term turns out to be a DC term, that's a constant, and that will tell you what the constant uh, offset of the tip of the cantilever is with respect to the substrate. So that's just the DC force between the two objects. And that depends on the voltage applied, the DC voltage applied to the tip, and the voltage, uh, the local voltage, the local potential difference, the local potential of the substrate. So that's that's the first term. The second term uh, involves a sine squared of omega 1, and that will produce by simple trigonometry a 2 omega 1 term, which we're not terribly interested in. The one we're most interested in is this third term, because when you just work out the arithmetic, you'll find that the third term has a Frequency dependence given by omega 1, where omega 1 is the frequency that you apply to the tip intentionally, so you adjust that. And the amplitude of that uh, sine of omega 1 term is just the difference between the contact, between the electrostatic potential on the substrate and the DC voltage that you apply to the tip. So if you set up a, a circuit, if you 
if you cook up an experiment to just measure the force on the tip at the frequency omega-1, you'll end up with a, a, a force that, that's represented by the, the last line in this slide. So this is the electrostatic force at frequency omega-1. It involves the change in capacitance with respect to Z, a number that we don't know terribly well. But most importantly, it depends on the difference in the electrostatic potential at a point x, y, uh, minus the DC voltage that we apply to the tip. And so you can see that you can make that electrostatic force at frequency omega-1 go to zero by just adjusting the DC voltage on the tip, all the while measuring the amplitude of the cantilever as it oscillates at that frequency omega-1. Okay, so there's an electrostatic force that's applied. The electrostatic force has a, uh, a specific uh, frequency signature, and you can null out that electrostatic force just by adjusting the DC voltage. So that's, that's really useful. Now, all the while you're doing that, all the while you're adjusting the third term in this force equation equal to zero, these other forces are still acting. They're always there, but you're not interested so much in those. You're interested in just trying to infer what V sub S is as a function of X and Y. And the way you do that is by just focusing on the third term in that force equation. So this is an example. This is one of the examples of dual probe capabilities of the atomic force microscope. This, this dual probe uh, capability uh, was was very interesting in the in the 1990s because everyone started to realize that not only could you get topography out of an AFM image, but you get you could get topography plus, right? So you could use the probe in a dual way. In, in this case, you're getting uh, potential differences across the substrate mapped out. In addition to getting the topography of the substrate, you get both at the same time. So that's the dual probe nature. This, this indicates how you make it work. It, it requires now two separate lock-ins. One lock-in indicated by the red arrows, the red lines, the red boxes. That's the standard, uh, standard uh, electronics that you would need to uh, map out topography. And then in addition, there's a uh, 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 electrostatic uh, force component of the microscope. The electrostatic force component of the microscope takes an adjustable voltage, which is indicated in this diagram by V tip. It sums it. There's a summing amplifier that adds that DC voltage to this AC voltage, which causes the electrostatic uh, voltage on the tip to oscillate with time with frequency omega one. Sums up those two voltages. It applies it to the tip, <coughs> which is now conducting, right? And so, uh, the output uh, by measuring the the the, uh, uh, the force between the tip and the substrate at frequency omega one using a separate lock in, right? You can get the electrostatic uh, potential as a function of x and y across the substrate. So basically, the way this diagram is set up, you physically have to adjust the tip voltage as the as the tip scans over the substrate. All the while you're adjusting the tip voltage, you're trying to minimize the force that the tip experiences at this frequency omega-1. Of course, you can't do that. So what you have to do is you have to build a circuit that automatically adjusts that DC voltage. And in that way, you map out the uh, V sub S uh, as a function of position. There are a number of different operational modes that this microscope can uh, take take on. Uh, there's the straight electrostatic force imaging mode. Um, in this mode, the voltage on the tip is basically held constant. And you're essentially looking at the deflection of the cantilever as it scans over the substrate. So this was this was a early implementation of, of electrostatic force microscopy. It's most useful if you use it to detect phase shifts in the electrostatic force with respect to the, uh, the, the AC voltage that you apply to the tip. I won't talk very much about that. 
Uh, there's this KFM imaging mode. I'll show you some examples of that. And then uh, perhaps the simplest mode to understand is just this, the, the straightforward electrostatic force curve. This is where you adjust the voltage on the tip, the, the DC voltage on the tip, and you measure the output of the lock-in detector. And you basically try to null the output of the lock-in detector. When they know the lock in, the output of the lock in detector, then the voltage, the DC voltage that you apply to the cantilever in the tip, that DC voltage is then equal to the, uh, the surface electrostatic potential at that point. So let me talk about that because it's, it's probably the easiest to understand. Um, this is a sequence of, um, of data curves that, that we collected a long time ago, actually. A student of mine, Steve Howe, worked all this stuff out for his thesis. Uh, he basically took a, a tip, coated it with gold, brought it close to a gold sample. And in this case, he biased the gold sample with respect to ground. Now, when the bias voltage of the gold sample was set to zero, uh, he just ramped the DC voltage applied to the tip and he measured the deflection of the cantilever as this bias voltage to the tip was ramped. When the bias voltage on the tip precisely cancels out the electrostatic potential of the gold surface where the tip is positioned, the electrostatic force goes to zero, and you can see that uh, the leftmost curve on this diagram indicates for V sub S equal to zero millivolts, uh, you can see that there's a very distinct minimum in the electrostatic force of the cantilever, and that minimum occurs at about minus 110 millivolts in this example. So that minus 110 millivolts is then telling you that the electrostatic potential between the tip and the substrate at the point where the tip is positioned, the contact potential difference at that point is about a minus, minus 110 millivolts. And then to prove everything is working properly, what you can do is you can bias the sample by a known amount by adjusting V sub S. And as you adjust the, the bias voltage on the sample by a known amount and repeat this measurement, sure enough, the, uh, the electrostatic force curve shifts in the appropriate way. And eventually, if you put uh, 110 millivolts on the sample, uh, then the electrostatic force curve would be zero at zero uh, tip voltage because then there would be no electric field between the tip and the substrate. So this is a simple test that, that you can do to convince yourself that you understand the microscope is actually working. Um, you can start to compare different materials now once you're convinced that, that everything is working as, as advertised. You can start to measure contact potential differences between two different materials. In this case, we looked at, uh, this is a gallium arsenide substrate. Uh, the black, the black uh, uh, rectangle in this picture is a gallium arsenide substrate. On top of that, we evaporated a very thin gold coating. We just positioned the tip over the gold. We positioned the tip over the gallium arsenide. We did these electrostatic force curves. You can see that there's clearly a difference in the zero force potential in these two cases. And just by measuring the difference in the, in the, in the potentials you have to apply to the tip in order to null out this contact potential difference, you can infer that uh, under these conditions of the experiment, there's about a 450 millivolt uh, change in the work function between gold and, and gallium arsenide. So this is, again, uh, just a real simple way, without scanning, just, just you can demonstrate very nicely that everything everything is working process. Is it, is it traditional to plot the EMF magnitude? Because uh, you know, if you sort of track uh, the phasals or and just make this is this is DC, this is, is a DC easy? force. This is just trying to convince ourselves that it's working. Okay. But even so, so for zero crossing, it, it helps to have a signal that changes from negative to positive, doesn't it? An electronic circuit to detect it. Yeah, that that comes in the next. That's that's when you start to apply the AC voltage. So this is just delta V squared. 
of force is proportional to delta V squared. It's just a DC voltage applied. It's very simple. Here we actually start to implement this AC voltage in this nulling technique where we automatically adjust the voltage on the tip to null out the uh, electrostatic potential difference. So what we did is we created uh, two gold films that are separated one from another by a trench. The insulating trench was just formed by uh, uh, a mask lithography process. The gold film on the left and the gold film on the right are electrically insulated one from another. So you can ground the gold film on the right, you can apply a potential to the gold film on the left, and then what you can start to do is you can start to implement this, this uh, KFM imaging concept. And you can, you can implement it by uh, measuring the potential, or by measuring the force on the cantilever at the frequency omega-1 as you start to scan the tip across the substrate. And what we did here is we just changed the voltage applied to the left gold film by increments of a half a volt. And I think you can see that the uh, electrostatic force image uh, uh, is now, uh, now acquires an additional force that's related to the voltage that you apply between the, the right film and the left film. And so by simply changing that voltage in well-known increments, you can see how the image itself changes its shape. So we're, we're, what we're doing here is we're artificially introducing a con artificially introducing a, a, a contact potential difference between the tip and the substrate by an unknown amount, simply by applying a voltage V that we can control. Right? And so when the voltage is positive, you can see that the image looks high. When the voltage, the contact potential difference between the tip and the substrate is negative, the image looks low, and uh, you start to get a sense of, of uh, the, the contact potential differences that varies as a function of position across the substrate. Yeah. We, we then implemented that, that idea to measure the charge on a nanometer cluster. And the idea is you can measure the, you can deposit, in this case we used a 20 nanometer gold cluster. Again, we put it on gallium arsenide substrate Using the AFM in a normal mode of operation, you can image the shape of that cluster. You can convince yourself it's what you think it should be. That's the image on the left. At the same time, you can apply a bias voltage to the tip and you'll get an electrostatic image of the cluster. The electrostatic image of the cluster is the image on the right. And this image was taken in this instance when the tip voltage was at plus 670 millivolts. So that's a constant value. Um, what we learned was that by just adjusting the voltage on the tip, right, you can make the electrostatic image disappear. So when the voltage on the tip equals the electrostatic voltage on the cluster, there's no electric field. The first approximation, there's no electric field between the tip and the cluster. There's no electrostatic field between those two. There's going to be no electrostatic force. So the electrostatic force image should then show a null result. There should be absolutely no contrast in the electrostatic force image. And what we learned is that uh, when we put minus 230 millivolts on the tip, then the signature of the, elect of, of the, electrosta the electrostatic signature of the cluster completely disappears. That's the bottom image on the, on the bottom right of this slide. So that tells us then that the cluster is actually charged up negative and it's charged to about a 230 millivolt potential. And so knowing the shape of the cluster, if you pretend the cluster is spherical, you make some very simple back of the envelope calculations, you can ask the question, how many charges have to be removed from the cluster to produce a 230 millivolt sphere that's uh, 20 nanometers in diameter? And the answer is about seven electrons. So we were able to infer that that particular cluster was charged. It was charged because somewhere in the process of deposition and formation, about seven charges had been removed from it. So it gives you a sense of, um, of, of what you can do with the technique. And it also 
I hope convinces you that if your object is small enough, you can actually start to estimate the, the total number of electrons that have been either added or removed to a small object just by measuring the electrostatic potential that that object acquires. Ross, so these gave them images that are amplitude at omega 1. Yes, these are. So nowadays you would probably measure the phase when you, when you make this measurement. This was before we realized phase was a useful, uh, useful technique. So this is, this is straight, not, this is a straight adjustment of the DC voltage on the tip to make the electrostatic image disappear. Yes? If you apply the bias to the tip though, how come the, the surrounding gallium arsenide didn't change or did it? I'm just well, the gallium arsenide is grounded, so there could be an overall shift, right? But we don't see that. Right? That's that. That would be a DC offset between one image and the other. We we just don't even look at that. I mean, we've proved we've proved we've understood that. In principle, I think we've proved we've understood that with this type of an experiment, where you can see that the total See, when you apply one volt to the left side of the gold film, the image rises up by a uniform. This is what you were saying, this is the first term, whereas the next picture is going to be the third term. Yeah, but, but the point is you're not sensitive to that total, I suppose you could be, but we weren't sensitive to that total offset. We were more interested in the relative offset between the gallium arsenide and the cluster. And I think in this case the cluster was surrounded by molecules, so... I think it was actually supported off the substrate by a molecular layer, provided some insulation between the two. I guess just to point out that you can you can you can start to use this electrostatic force microscopy to understand uh, uh, electrical contacts to let's say nanowires, and so this is another example of, a, of an experiment that we did where we took a multi-walled nanotube and we evaporated um, uh, gold contact pads to both ends of the multi-walled nanotube as, as we've got drawn in the upper right uh, panel of this, this diagram. And once you've got electrical contact to this multi-walled nanotube, then you can apply a potential difference and you can start to study how current flows through the multi-walled nanotube. <laughs> So in this particular experiment, what we did is we applied too much current through the multi-wall nanotube. The multi-wall nanotube exploded. It blew up, right? That's shown in the next slide, where on the left we show a topography image. You can see there's a break in the multi-wall nanotube. So now electrostatically, the left contact and the right contact are no longer in electrical contact with each other is the multi-wall nanotube's got a break. So the argument is, if you then try to do an electrostatic force microscope image of that multi-wall nanotube, the multi-wall nanotube attached to the left contact should charge up to the potential that you apply to the left contact. So if you, if you pretend that the right contact is at ground potential, you apply a voltage to the left contact, then the multi-wall nanotube should acquire that potential of the contact uh, pad. And when we did the electrostatic force microscope image, you could see that that actually happening. You can see that the there's a bright region that extends into the gap, which indicates that the multi-wall nanotube is acquiring the potential that we apply to the left contact. You can see an abrupt change in that electrostatic force as you go from the, uh, uh, as you go across the break in the multi-wall nanotube, and that's indicated by the green curve uh, in this, uh, the green data points in this curve. If you go and just do an electrostatic force image between the two contact pads, you move far away from the multi-wall nanotube, you would expect roughly a linear drop in the electrostatic potential between the left and the right contacts, and that's what you see in the in the red with the red data points. It looks looks like there's a linear drop in electrostatic potential as you go from the left to the right 
contact. So this, this again is a, a, a simple example of, of how, how you can implement this electrostatic force microscope to gain information about, let's say, the connectivity of nanowires between electrical contacts. Um, I, just, I just wanted to end the lecture by mentioning the uh, limitations of the technique. No technique in AFM is perfect. There's always uh, limitations. And uh, in the case of electrostatic force microscopy, uh, this is also the case. And the problem is that the cantilever uh, couples to the substrate because there's a big capacitance between the flat cantilever and the substrate. Ideally, what you want to think about is you just want to think about the capacitance between the apex of the tip and the substrate. And you like to believe that dominates the electrostatic force image. But in reality, there's this big, large, uh, flat cantilever, which is electrically conducting also. And the electrostatic voltage that you apply to the tip is also applied to the cantilever. So that causes a, a smearing out of the, um, of the resolution of the electrostatic force microscope. And um, there's a nice paper published in 1998, which shows that if you take this, uh, this, this idea and apply it, um, the voltage that you need to uh, apply to the tip to make the electrostatic force equal to zero, that voltage is now no longer equal to the contact potential difference, but it's a weighted sum, uh, which I indicate in this green box, and the weighted sum is how the capacitance of the tip changes with respect to Z, versus how the capacitance of the cantilever changes with respect to Z. So in this, this simple idea, you've got a tip, which let's say you represent as C1, and you've got a cantilever, which you represent as a capacitance C2. The DC voltage that you need to apply to null out the electrostatic force now depends on how the capacitance C1 changes with respect to Z, how the capacitance C2 changes with respect to Z, and it also depends on the change in the electrostatic potential, phi 1 and phi 2, that you're trying to measure, two different points on the substrate. So this causes a complication, and I try to uh, investigate that logic in a, in a reasonably systematic way in this sequence of diagrams. <clears throat> in this case, I just model different regions of the tip as different capacitors, so let's say... The tip can be broken up into three different capacitors, C1, C2, and C3. Each capacitance is dominated by a different tip substrate separation. And now I'm trying to image a substrate which has, a, let's say, a central region. There's five segments on the substrate. The central region, the central portion of the substrate is one volt positive with respect to the other four. And if I just apply this algorithm and ask the question, what is the DC voltage that I have to apply to the tip to make the electrostatic force go to zero, I then have to calculate all these derivatives of capacitance with respect to Z. I make some real simple assumptions just to, just to get an estimate of, of, of how the capacitance with respect to Z might change. Uh, and you put in some numbers, and what you find is that when, let's say, the apex of the tip is positioned over region two of the substrate, you would like to believe that your tip bias applied to the cantilever would be zero volts in order to null out the electrostatic force between the tip and the substrate. But because of these convolution effects, it turns out the DC voltage is on the order of 0.17 volts. So if you want to map out in detail, let's say, the red curve here, which would show how the electrostatic voltage across the substrates varies with position. At point two, instead of getting zero volts, you would end up with a number that's close to 0.17 volts. And I just, I, I just do the, the thing again for another case. In this case, the tip is now located over the one volt region of the substrate. Uh, Again, you model the capacitance between the 
various regions of the tip and the substrate. You model that as parallel plates because it's easy to take a derivative. You can find DC, DZ if you pretend those are parallel plate capacitors. You can put in the numbers and what you find is that instead of measuring, instead of applying a DC voltage to your cantilever of one volt to null out the electrostatic potential, now you're applying a, you, you actually uh, apply a voltage of 0.67 volts. 0.67 volts would then null out the electrostatic force. And so then you would conclude as an experimentalist that the potential at that region of the substrate is 0.67 volts, when in reality it's one. Okay, so you make a mistake. Right. So this is a this is a a, a real problem. I, I just completed to sh so. Right, <laughs> you'd like to believe you're measuring the red curve, but in reality you're measuring the green curve, and there's a significant difference between the two. So you have to you have to worry about all these effects to properly interpret the magnitude of the contact potential difference that your microscope is telling you that you're measuring. Uh, one of my students, Brian Walsh, generalized this to a more realistic model. This is a toy model that gives you the right idea of what's going on. Uh, he, he generalized it to a, a, a pyramidal shaped tip. He broke the pyramidal shaped tip up into small uh, segments calculated the capacitance of these small segments with respect to a flat substrate. Flat substrate had a very simple potential difference, a potential profile applied. It, it had a, um, a, a voltage applied of 0.5 volts in a small square region located in the center of the substrate. And he then rastered, he rastered this tip over that, that potential difference to see what was actually measured. So this is a more realistic estimate of the errors. So this is just a line scan uh, shown by that dotted white curve across this region of the substrate. And, and the, uh, the bottom right-hand panel of this transparency shows the calculated electrostatic potentials that he measured, taking into account this convolution effect and he compares it to the actual profile, which is indicated by the solid line. Uh, the actual profile is uh, is 500 millivolts high, and the experimental value depends on the half angle of the tip. It depends on how sharp the tip is. Is the is the half angle of the tip opens up, you can see that the measurements get worse, uh, and and actually resolving the, the the true contact potential difference. So. Depending on that half angle, uh, you can make it, you can, you can infer from this that you can make errors in contact potential difference by factors of two or three. Okay. Um, we tried to improve the situation. One logical thing to do is to move the tip, uh, the, the bulk nature of the tip to move that from the substrate. We thought we could do that by, let's say, attaching a nanowire to the tip. So we simulated, uh, uh, uh the case where we had a, a long rod. Well, the rod wasn't that long. It was a, a micron or three microns long. We attached that rod to the tip. And sure enough, the simulations showed that when the rod was attached to the tip, now every, you're, you're basically pushing the, the cantilever further away from the substrate. So you're decreasing the, the effect of the electrostatic force on the cantilever with respect to the substrate. You're more and more emphasizing the electrostatic force between the tip and the substrate. And sure enough, uh, if, if the, the, the nano wire we attached to the tip was one or three na three microns long. Uh, the agreement uh, between what you would expect and what we calculated improved. All right, so now we're only making uh, maybe a 20, 30 percent error rather than factors of two. And then we actually tried to implement this. We actually put a carbon nanotube on the tip and we measured the uh, uh, profile, and I think it's I think it's clear that the red curve, which was with the nanotube tip, that is much sharper. 
it's not as um, it's not as <coughs> rounded as the case when we measured the same electrostatic profile with a standard tip, which is indicated by green. So it does look like these sharper tips give better results. And I'd like to also point out that nowadays you can buy these sharp tips. They're commercially available. So this is a, a picture I got from the website of Naga Needles. Naga Needles is a company in Louisville. They, they can grow these very sharp tips on the end of cantilevers. And based on what we learned about this electrostatic force microscope uh, a long time ago when we were developing it here at Purdue, Right, these nanoneedles now would give much better estimates of local electrostatic potential differences than just the bare tip. So I think the moral of the story is if you're into this electrostatic force microscopy, it's probably worthwhile for you to invest in some of these sharper tips. I think your measurements will be better and, uh, um, and more accurate. So, uh, just to summarize, um, this electrostatic force microscope is just one of many examples of this dual probe nature of an atomic force microscope. With the electrostatic force microscope, you can get topography out. So, for instance, if you have two objects on a substrate, uh, it's possible to measure the topography of those uh, objects in a traditional way. So, you can get height versus position. But by biasing the cantilever, okay, by biasing the cantilever with respect to the substrate, you can also get more information. You can start to measure the electrostatic force. And if the electrostatic force is positive or negative, it indicates that the, the objects on the substrate are charged positive or negative with respect to the voltage that you apply to the tip. So, uh, this is kind of a, uh, you know, a summary slide, something that maybe you'll remember six months from now. Uh, as you work your way through your research projects, you may need this capability. Uh, I think you can probably get about 50 nanometer resolution in cha with changes in the electrostatic uh, potential across a substrate. So if you have pieces of nanowire or, or, or nanotransistors or whatever your project involves, I think if if, if the dimensions of those objects are greater than 50 nanometers or so, you can probably measure with some precision the uh, variation in the electrostatic potential across those devices. Non-contact, right? You don't, you don't have to hook up electrical leads here. You can just measure things straight away. So I think my time is up, and I'll uh, be happy to answer any questions that I'm sure you might have. Yeah. When you say like, <coughs> excuse me, like an EFM image, is that something that you measure exactly with the AFM, or is that like a post-image processing type of deal? No, the EFM image. Well, of course, at the. So the question is, does the EFM image come out at the same time as you measure your topography? I think that's the question, and the answer is it depends on your controller and it depends on your software. But I think now, nowadays, most controllers have software built in so that in one window you get topography, another window you could get phase, right. the third window you could get the electrostatic force as a function of position. So you get an image that just appears before your eyes as you scan. Right. Okay. I just uh, couldn't help but notice that, uh, you know, in so if you go back to following up on the question of the EFM image, that what was plotted was, um, uh, you know, the amplitude uh, at the omega-1 frequency, which is the AC fluctuation of the voltage applied. Uh, two things. First of all, as you change the bias voltage, uh, at a certain voltage, you find that the, uh, uh, you know, you don't see the cluster anymore because it's in that channel. Uh, if one were implementing EFM uh, as the scheme that you described, during the scan you would be changing the voltage, right? And then you would then plot. Um, so that, that's slightly different from the image that you just showed, right? Yes. This this was to show that you can cancel that. Well, this work was done 
10 years ago. So we did not have the capability to adjust the DC voltage applied to the tip, right? You need another feedback loop, basically, to control the electrostatic. So if you controlled on the zero electrostatic force, you'd be constantly adjusting that DC bias, and you could record that as a function of position. The other thing I was going to say is that if you look at that expression for uh, the electrostatic force that you had, you had a DC term, omega, omega 1, and 2 omega 1 term. Uh, by zeroing the omega 1 term, I, I hadn't noticed this before, you're also zeroing the DC term. Uh, so it actually does a dual purpose. It, it sort of gets rid, rid of the... You know, yeah, I think, the, I think you're right. ...drift that comes in. So it's that VSXY minus whatever term. Right. Whatever else yeah. is multiplied is just... Whatever right. He's right. That sets the, the and term you, essentially to zero. Yeah, and which which probably helps remove any topography artifacts that just come from the, the BC uh, bias. Yeah. So, no, you're right. I, I didn't appreciate it that, but that's a good good thing. It's clearly there. <laughs>